This is Ed Perkins, and you're listening to Monday Morning Critic Podcast. Ask you first, Your Royal Highness, what was your instant impression? Well, I remember thinking what a very jolly and amusing and, and attractive 16-year-old she was. I don't know what you thought of me. But... Pretty amazing. <laughs> <laughs> Sweet, kind. The princess has been the best thing to happen to the monarchy in centuries. Did you get a chance to see her? Yes! Diana is very big news everywhere. She's got the common touch. The prince realizes that he's taking second place. By the way. <laughs> a hollow and tormented marriage are giving the British media and its public little else to talk about. Just give me one question, my Out. Oh. She's been pushed from the word go. It's the media that's causing the problems. Thanks. Leave them alone. Lady Diana. She's been through the worst that can be thrown at her. I think we've got an unhealthy obsession. I think she's very close to being a monster. She has a sick mind. She likes to be with people. She likes to be bloody well to... watched. <laughs> That's ridiculous. She has been humiliated. When you put a modern person in an ancient institution, they will be destroyed. The monarchy is in danger of too much publicity. At what point British people say, I don't want to hear anymore. What's wrong with us as a country? Should this mean so much to us? They just can't sweep her under the carpet. She's going to be a woman. Who's fighting? Doomed to continue. Wait. Separate lives. Very energetic. She's taking shots. Saturation. Look through there. You see, you see things going on inside it. Look. You see the faces. The people in there. Look at them. <laughs> Trapped. So much. So as I mentioned, you came on for a second time, and thank you so much for that. Um, you know, for those listening, or maybe this is the first time they've 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 heard you. Um, you've done some pretty amazing things. Um, the, the princess, tell me who I am. Black sheep, uh, gardens cold, bare knuckle fight club. Um, and the one thing I really love about your work, Ed, and, and I might have said this the first time, I'm not sure, is the diversity in your projects. No two are ever alike, where I think that maybe filmmakers, whether they're doing documentaries or not, I feel oftentimes tend to gravitate towards the same topic. That is not an issue for you at all. And I love that about you. Well, that's kind. I mean, it's not a conscious decision, I have to say. I mean, I, yeah. I, I, I tend not to overthink the, the the projects too much when we start. I mean, I need to be convinced that I'm going to be fascinated and obsessed by the storyline for the next two years because that's often how long it takes to make the film but i i've tried not to be too introspective and find any kind of links between the stories um this story you know the things that motivated me to to make this film are are, are frankly very different from the motivating factors but, but you know that I've, I've i've had on previous projects um and it's been a very different journey in part because of covid and in part because it's a film about someone who's no longer alive um, so yeah, they, they, every film definitely throws up its own particular challenges. Now, and Ed, so, so, you know, we could take the princess or another project is, is it oftentimes personal for you? Is it, is it something you're just interested in? Because, you know, like I said, there, there's such diversity in it and, and I, and I get what you're saying that, you know, each has their own reasons. Are they ever personal? Are they ever, you know, this would make a good story. What, what is the philosophy behind, you know, cause you're essentially devoting your years into a project, right? So what is the underlying um, um motivation for you yeah i mean i guess to some extent they are all personal um with a sort of broad definition of that word i mean tell me who i am was a story that i just felt immensely moved by when i first read about it and then when i met the twins we we created a real bond between us and i felt i felt a responsibility to try to tell their story in the in in the most sensitive and and um truthful way possible I think with this film in particular, I do feel a strangely personal connection to it, although it probably needs explaining. Um, you know, I was 11 when Diana died and I never met her. Um, and yet I, I feel this strange connection to perhaps her or what she came to represent. Um, and I think probably many of your listeners will feel a similar thing. And I think millions of people around the world do feel a strange connection with Diana. 
and feel like they have this sort of personal relationship with her, even though they never met her. And 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 for me, the sort of emotional starting point for this film was a very visceral, vivid memory of the moment when I was told that she died. And you know, I, I think in my life, there's really only two moments where it felt like time just kind of stopped, like the earth sort of stopped spinning. One of those was 9/11, and and the other was was the death of Diana. And I, as an 11 year old, I just have this like absolutely like pinpoint sharp memory of where I was that morning and my mum coming in and waking me up and being very, very sad. And then our whole family kind of gathering around this little TV in their par- in my parents' room and, and watching that sort of extraordinary footage um, in the days after um, Diana's death um, of, tens and then hundreds of thousands of people taking to the streets of London and, and all around the world. And this sort of extraordinary outpouring of collective public grief, you know, and there were grown men and women sort of crying on the streets of London and shrines being built. And it was totally unprecedented. And as, as an 11 year old, I don't necessarily remember feeling sad. Like I was sad that someone famous had died, sad that someone who lots of people seemed to care about and, and and whose life people were invested in had died but I don't remember crying I just remember I remember feeling very confused and just looking at the tv thinking I don't understand what's happening and I don't understand why people are reacting in such a um a strong and emotive way and and that kind of feeling of uncomfortableness or confusion has just sat sat with me over the years and as I like everyone else have watched the crown or watched Spencer or read the books that feeling has sort of, yeah, it's not gone away. And I, I felt that the part of the puzzle that hadn't been explored as much in Diana's story was, you know, what not so much what does this film say about Diana, um, but but more what does it say about all of us? And, and why did we react in the way we did both throughout her life and after she died? So that was the sort of emotional starting point for, for wanting to take this film on. Yeah, that's well said. And we're going to hop into that in one moment. But I did want to say one thing about um, Marcus and Alex Lewis. Uh, Ed, I was not, when we did that interview, I was very excited because I loved the the movie. I loved it. Um, but I was not ready. Like, even when I mention their names now, I kind of get choked up. N- not because of what happened during the film, but having the conversation and realizing what type of people these two are. Like, they're some, um, they're amazing human beings. Like, they're, yeah. it, it, you know, what they went through is one thing. The way they've decided to deal with it moving on, like, I mean, I can't even tell you about the amount of emails I received, the comments on YouTube. I mean, people love these two. I mean, oh, yes, yes, what 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 happened was awful, but like, but but it's it's just how they proceed forward. I still to this day, I have such admiration for them. Well, I, I do too. I mean, hopefully meeting them this week or next for a for a catch up. Um but, oh, nice. Uh, they are they are extraordinary, I mean, truly extraordinary people. And I still receive, like you, emails all the time um, from people who have come across the film on Netflix and have engaged with this story and been moved by it. I mean, I had a screening the other day of The Princess and someone rushed up to me afterwards saying, you know, The Princess, I loved it, but, you know, tell me who I am really moved me beyond, you know, um, words. And and they'd had a similar experience in their life and um, I think found real resonance with what, with what Marcus was saying and his his recounting of what had happened to them as children and uh that's kind of why we make these films on yeah. some deep level right like we're, we're trying to tell stories that we that we think are important and 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 it is the greatest privilege if, if those those films go out into the world and 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 um yeah affect change in people's lives i guess yeah there's some wonderful human beings and you know I, I wanted to say with the princess so so and my favorite movie of all time is the shawshank redemption and for a lot of reasons but that movie is driven by narration right that's it's just it, it's it's as you know but I, what i loved about the princess was you threw the facts up there and it was like decide for yourself there was no narrator there was no current interviews it was i just thought beautifully put together it was just awesome it lets the the, the viewer decide and, and, and kind of get a front row seat into Diana's life. And, and and I thought the idea and how you approach this was just genius. Oh, well, that's kind. I mean, that, that the, the the decision to not have a narrator was really the sort of first decision that we took in this film. And I I guess it sort of stems off the back of this anecdote I've told you about, about the memory of, of her death and that, that week afterwards and how it made me feel. I, I guess for a long time, I, I felt that there's no 
there's no simple explanation for what happened that week, but I but I have felt for a long time that perhaps a documentary that eschewed the kind of traditional headshot interview and retrospective analysis and instead aimed at something much more present tense where the story was sort of unfolding in front of you in the present tense um, and, and, and that the, the form of the film act as uh, a bit of a time machine that picked you up and took you back into your own nostalgic past and didn't let you leave. Um, whether that might allow us to sort of access some of the emotional truths that I think are still lurking in this story. Um, and, and I guess the other strong feeling I had was that there have been a lot of documentaries made about Diana over the years. There's been a lot of books, there's been podcasts, you know, it's probably one of the most told and retold stories of the last few decades. And I guess my analysis was that a lot of the documentaries were kind of consciously interior, you know, and I think by that, I mean that they're, they're their explicit aim seems to be to try to get inside Diana's head and try to understand, you know, what made her tick, you know, to understand her psyche, to understand her motivations, to understand how she might have been feeling. And all of that is is fascinating and interesting, but it does involve speculation, you know, a degree of speculation, because, of course, we'll never know for large parts of her life exactly how she was feeling. And And so I guess my strong feeling was that the as I said before, the most interesting part, the most unexplored part of the Diana story isn't what it says about her as a character, but more what it says about all of us. And so my hope is that this, this archive only form by not having a narration telling you what to feel, um, that we're somehow able to force the camera back onto all of us and that the film acts as a kind of mirror, that it holds a mirror up to all of us and, and perhaps forces us to explore some complicated questions about our relationship to yes to Diana but more broadly to the monarchy or perhaps more broadly still to to celebrity culture you know which is still still ongoing and the sort of central question for me is 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 around our our sort of active role in this story and in ongoing stories like this like what was our complicity in this tragic tale yeah and and, and the brazen questions that they asked her was so dis were so disrespectful i mean even even towards the end there's I, I probably should know who he is but i don't there was a man in the park talking about you know we're not going to really miss her you, you want it on and people are like sticking up for her. and he comes back even like just the way people talked about her not only you know the questions they would approach her on the street with but even after she passed she was still taking some of that guff from people that were like you know, overwhelmingly, people loved her, but but still, there's that negative element, primarily driven from the media. But like it, to, to absorb that, to watch that, Ed, is heartbreaking. Yeah, I mean, I think what's interesting about the negative media is that that, that my memory of her, the the last year of her life in particular, was that before she died, she spent the summer on the south coast of France and. She was spending time with Dodi Fired, um, and they were in a relationship together. The media was reporting, and there was a lot of criticism about Diana at that point from the press and from the public. Um, people were critical of her, you know, relationship. They were critical of rumors that she might be moving abroad. Um, and of course, there were a lot of people who still loved her, but it's there was a sense to which, like, the, the tides were slightly starting to change, and there, there was more criticism. And then, of course when she died and because of the tragic nature of her death and how young she was all of that criticism sort of got forgotten you know overnight she was canonized and and she became a sort of a perfect saint and and i guess part of this film is about trying to bring back to life the the truth not of necessarily just of her character but of also the way that we we consumed her story that we projected onto her the things we said about her and we did say some some pretty critical things about her throughout her life, actually. And one of the, yeah, I guess shocking things going back into the archive was that we did find a lot of very strong things being said that with a modern ear sound, um, yeah, uh, kind of, yeah, mad and far out there. Um, there certainly wouldn't be things that would be said now, but we felt it was important to, to use that. I mean, it, it felt as though for most of her, public life um, and you know for 16 17 years she was on the most public of stages we all dissected everything she did everywhere she went everything she said you know everything she wore 
um, was analyzed and dissected um, and was sort of there for public consumption. And, and the film is in a sense a critique of, of that and, and the way in which we did. And I think continue to, to turn stories of people in public life into a, a form of entertainment, almost like a national soap opera or a national sitcom. And, and there's a price to that, you know, we, we want the fairy tale, but at, at what cost, you know, at, at whose expense? And while the film isn't trying to assign blame, it is trying to, I guess, stir up a conversation about, about our role and our complicity in, in this story. Yeah. And how difficult was it? Cause the footage is amazing. Like as somebody who, who was a history major in, in college, I just, I was just in awe of it. Never mind the editing that went into it. I can't even imagine but but some of that footage I never I mean granted it was older footage and I never been seen before I mean I I know a lot of people whether, whether they saw the movie or left mm. reviews or they had not seen this footage how difficult was it to assemble at all the foot ar archival footage for you it was it was a mammoth task I mean for most of her adult life Diana was one of the most filmed and photographed people on the planet and so when we started this film the amount of archive that very quickly came into our edit was. Um, yeah, it was overwhelming. I mean, hundreds of hours. I think we, we got pretty close to a thousand hours of archive. And perhaps naively at the beginning of the process, I I sort of I gave the direction to our archive team just to go and find everything that existed on Diana because I felt it was important not to go in with a pre preconceived idea of what story we wanted to tell. I wanted to try to be guided by the archive. Um, and also when you're when you're making documentaries like this, you're always hoping that they're will be a secret treasure trove of archive that you'll uncover. I think the, the, the reality was that with Diana, we knew that there had been many filmmaking teams, great teams done before us, and the chance of us finding an enormous treasure trove of archive that had never been seen before was slim. But I think what we did have on our side was, was time. You know, we, we were able um, to spend longer looking at the archive and longer trying to piece this mosaic of a film together and as a result I was really able to watch the archive you know minute by minute I spent the first six or seven months of the filmmaking process just watching archive every day eight ten twelve hours a day and I would watch and watch and watch and then I would find something that I found was interesting or that confused me or I just found myself kind of leaning into the screen thinking you know what is going on here what is Diana trying to say or you know, what is the relationship on camera? And I would mark it up and put these little selects reels together for our incredible ed editors, Jinx Godfrey and Dan Lapira, who would then take, you know, footage from all these disparate sources and camera angles and, and weave this tapestry. Um, but it is, it is a mammoth task. And, you know, we talked earlier about not having narration. Narration and headshot interviews are two of the sort of traditional building blocks of documentary storytelling. Mm. When you remove them, it, it, it does take, you know, it is a chat, it's a formal challenge, you know, just telling this story from A to B to C, just, just guiding your audience through the, this happened, then this happened, then this happened, part of the story is complicated and just takes a lot of time in the edit. But the real challenge with this film in particular was that, of course, we already know the twists and turns of this story. Our film isn't a revelatory film in that sense. We're trying to offer a new and distinctive perspective on this age old story. But we all know the basic building blocks, the narrative beats of the story. And so seven or eight or nine months into the edit, we, we got to a three hour cut of the film and we were kind of patting ourselves on the back thinking we've cracked it. We've managed to get from the beginning to the end without any narrator, without any interview. And we can tell the story but we realized that all we were doing at that point was telling a story that everyone already knew. And that's really when, from a filmmaking point of view, the, the creative challenge started because we suddenly realized that we, we just really had our foundation. And onto that, we had to build layers, nuance and depth and, and, and subtlety and, and, and try to get the audience to, to engage with the, the subtext of the story, which I think is where the most interesting ideas and themes lie. Yeah, because the clips seem to flow together. Uh, I, I can't, like you said, I can't imagine the work that went into it because they do flow. It does tell this wonderful story. Uh, oh. I, I, I would be, I would be uh, wrong if I did not mention the amazing Martin Phipps in his score. He's been on the podcast before. He is, at, he, as you know, he's an absolute wizard. He is a talent that, that I've never seen before. He's a genius, and uh, we were incredibly lucky to work with him. He's been working on the Crown 
Um, yes. You know, sort of immersed in this world. Um, and yet, you know, we were trying to do something quite different, I think. Um, this is a, it's a difficult score, I think, to, to come up with because, um, well, there, there's a couple of, there's a couple of things going on. One is that it took us a long time in the filmmaking process to really understand what we needed the score to do in our film. That sounds like a slightly silly thing to say, but actually, you know, often with documentaries, we're trying, I'm trying very hard not to, to, to use a score that is too emotionally leading. I don't want the music to, to tell you how to feel or to, or, or, or to hold the audience's hand. I'm trying, certainly not succeeding always, but I'm trying to make films that give audiences the space and respect to come to their own conclusions. That's what we tried to do in Tell Me Who I Am, to tell that story with the lightness of touch. We tried to do the same thing here. And, and, and music is, is integral to, to, to that sensibility. And I think when we temp scored this film, we were, we were probably being too conservative and too safe with the music. And we realized quite late in the edit that actually the film needed to give the, uh, the, the score needed to give the film a shape, you know, a dramatic shape. It needed, needed to push those, so those big grandiose moments like the wedding higher. And it also needed to, in the, in the more poignant emotional moments, pull us a bit lower and, 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 and yet do that in a way that didn't feel too manipulative and leading. And I think Martin somehow has walked that tightrope. Um, and I can't imagine our film without his score anymore. You know, I sit and listen to his score and I'm, 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 I feel immensely proud that, yeah, it's, it's a part of our, our film because I think it's, it's an extraordinary piece of work. Yeah, you guys make a great team. Um, you know, you mentioned The Crown, uh, Spencer, of course. Um, two, one, a great TV show, one, a great movie. Um, I love them both a lot. Um, for those in the States, I'm trying to process, Ed, what the royal family is, right? I get the tradition. I get the history. I get the 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 foundation of it. Uh, but I also feel like sometimes it seems like a horror movie and a cult. And it's like, you know, for lack of better words, it's it's scary. I mean, what what's, what, what's your take, Ed, on the... How should people perceive the the royal family? Because I know everyone sees it differently. You know, it's an institution. It's it's all those things. But like, you watch these movies and these shows. It's you can't help but have some negative feelings. I mean, um, your thoughts on that, Ed? I think it's. I think our relationship to the monarchy is 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 complex. And um, you know, I, I I have an interesting. Well. I lived in America for five years. I went to university in America in yeah. North Carolina for four years and then lived in New York for a year. So in those formative years in my early adult life, I wasn't in the UK. And so when I came back to the UK 10 years ago, 15 years ago, I, I did feel a bit of an outsider actually. And um, I guess my feelings on the monarchy are that I don't think any institution in public life, especially one that wields enormous power and influence, should be free from criticism. Um, yeah. I, I would also say that it is possible to, to distinguish the institution of monarchy from the royal family, which is the, the people that make up the, 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 the royal family today. And, and one can be critical of, of the monarchy and, 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 and also sympathetic towards the specific human beings that are often, you know, are born into these roles that have no choice but to, to live these lives. And I think it's a very difficult position to be born into. And I think on the whole, they are trying to do a very difficult job well. Um, does that mean they're perfect? No. Are they flawed and fallible like all of us? Yes, absolutely. Do, are there mistakes that have been made, you know, in in the Diana story? Yes, clearly. And, and they continue to be made. Um, they are also, you know, having their lives scrutinized in a way that that I think anyone would find incredibly difficult. Um, I think one of the things that our film is trying to explore is the relationship between the people and monarchy. And at the heart of that, there is this strange paradox because, you know, I think there's a there's a question. Do we, and I'm talking about the you know people in, in the United Kingdom, do we want our royal family, our monarchy, to be just like us? Do we want them to be normal and open and transparent and approachable? Or actually, do we want them to be other? Do we want them to be different? Do we want to pretend or think that they're special, that they, you know, and retain this sense of magic? The truth is that I think we probably, or most of us, want both of those things at the same time. And 
and that's a hard you know it's almost impossible to, to have both of those things uh, because they seem to be juxtaposing one another I think at times in Diana's life, perhaps uniquely, she was able to to be both things. She was able somehow to 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 be able to relate to normal people and have the common touch, but but also clearly to to sprinkle the magic stardust wherever she went. And I think that is that is um, that's an extraordinary thing that she somehow figured out how to do. Um, there's a really interesting line in the film from Diana herself, actually, and she I'm paraphrasing, but she says something like that she hopes the royal family could walk more hand in hand with the people rather than be so distant. Mm. I think there's something, it's, it's an incredibly insightful and, and actually sort of prescient line because I think what you see in more recent events, you know, we've just celebrated a Jubilee um, this summer um, and there were these extraordinary scenes of a massive sort of pop, you know, popular culture concert in front of Buckingham Palace and, and, the Queen famously had tea with Paddington Bear, who's a sort of animated mm -hmm. character um, and part of sort of British folklore, I guess, and, 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 and pop culture. And, you know, one wonders whether scenes like that could have happened without Diana's influence. No one mm -hmm. will ever know, but she does, I think, you know, her influence, I think, can be seen clearly through her children, through William and Harry and, and, and the way that she and, and Charles brought them up. Um, but I think that the relationship between monarchy and people is is such an interesting one to talk about now because we are at an inflection point you know at some point inevitably in the coming years there will be a change at the top of the british royal family um we will have a king you know the elizabethan era will come to an end yeah and and i think all these kind of questions will will you know be asked again um so yeah i i, I think I, I like most people have a complex relationship with it um i do think it's you know i think one of the things i could i'd also say which i perhaps is unexpected is that you know after two years of making this film i come out feeling much more sympathetic towards the specific members of the royal family than i perhaps felt going into it you know and i think that's partly because at its core documentary is an exercise in empathy you know it forces you to to empathize with other people's lives and other people's situations. And, and this film, this story has made me realize or think of the people at the heart of this story as human beings rather than as characters in a sort of national sitcom. And, and doing that has been, yeah, for me at least personally, has been a, an enlightening um, yeah, journey to, to, to take. Ed, when you when you say specific members, are you talking William, Harry? Are you? Is there anybody that you specifically? Yeah, Charles, Diana. Um, yeah, yeah, I think so. You know, the, yeah. the people at the heart of the story. Um, I, I definitely feel more sympathetic towards all of them and the decisions, often very difficult decisions they were forced to make. Um, but but as I said, you know, I, I haven't come into this film with any set agenda. You know, I right, haven't. Right. I mean, trying to make a pro-monarchy or anti-monarchy film or a pro-Diana or anti-Diana film. I think people will come out feeling different things. Some people will feel, you know, we've been more on one side than the other. I, You know, the Diana story, as you said, and Diana as a person when she was alive and, 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 and since she died, she, she ignites strong opinions in lots of different directions. You know, very few people I know are apathetic towards either Diana or the royal family. You know, this... this this world you know uh people have strong opinions on 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 these things and and that's okay um and uh and we're trying to make a film that embraces that complexity and tries not to to oversimplify this complex relationship between people and monarchy yeah you certainly tell a story where, where less people decide which is what filmmaking should be um you know the one line that does stick with me ed is the um when you put a mo it's in the trailer in the movie when you put a modern uh person in an ancient institution they will be destroyed. And that, that just, I, I think about that a lot, you know? Yeah. I mean, I think it's, look, I, I think it's important when making a film about a story like this, that where people have very strong opinions on it, not to be too prescriptive about pe what people take away from the story. I, I'm trying to leave room in it for people to draw their own conclusions. I think it's also fair to say that a lot of people who have seen the film are drawing um, links between certain elements of Diana's story, certain themes that her, her life offers up and more recent events and 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 specifically towards 
you know Harry and Meghan and their decision to to, to move from the UK to the US and um, you know I, I I think that's interesting and it's been interesting for me to to listen to and read people's reactions and 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 some of the echoes and reflections they might be finding in the story um, but I, I I'm trying not to prescribe you know too much you know what I think those links should be because I, I think they're there to be discovered um, if if people so find them. Yeah, and, and not in your film, but in, in other films, um, I, I feel like the common theme or, or the, the com I don't know if it's a, it's a goal, but Charles is certainly vilified, not here, but but other films and, and shows, he's certainly vilified. I mean, there's, there, I mean, it's all over, it's been all over for a while where, you know, he, he is vilified. Um, and I'm not going to ask you if he's deserving of that, uh, but but is, is, is that the how is he perceived in, in in England? How is he perceived by 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 people in that area? Is is he? Do they feel the same way? Is it is it is he is he looked at as the person that is in some way responsible for what happened to Diana's demise or whatever you wanted to say on that? Ed? Look, I think there's I think lots of people have lots of different views towards that. I mean, certainly, and and I think those views have have changed over time. You know, we're in a very difficult, different position now than we were 25 years ago. Right. Um, I think 25 years ago, um, when Diana died, I think it was sort of broadly inconceivable that Charles would 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 marry Camilla. Um, and and yet we're in a position now when I think broadly most people feel very, I mean, I say broadly, very happy that they seem happily married and they're a great match for each other. And um, and seem to make each other happy. Um, I, I guess, you know, I go back to what I said earlier, I, I do feel much more sympathetic towards um, Charles than I did going in. I think it's right. it's a it's a difficult role to be born into, a really difficult one. Does that mean that he hasn't made, you know, that he's perfect? No. Is he flawed and fallible? Yes, like all of us. Has he made mistakes? Yes. Will he continue to? Yes. Um, but I think on the whole, my sense for what it's worth is that he's really... Yeah, he's 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 tried to do what he thought was the right thing to do, you know, for the country. Um, he tried to do his duty in difficult circumstances. Um, is this a story that he probably wants retold over and over again? No, um, I'm I'm aware of that. We felt it was an important story to to retell. We feel like it has a contemporary resonance. Um, my hope would be that if if he saw the film or if anyone from the royal family saw the film that they would feel as though we've been fair and balanced in our portrayal mm -hmm. uh, that's certainly our intention um you know in good faith we've gone in as i said without without an agenda um but that doesn't mean that we're um you know avoiding the the more complicated and difficult parts of the story it's important to be truthful when we're telling these stories and and, and to get at we what we think is the emotional heart of the story um but look the purpose of of our film the perspective that we're trying to offer up is unlike a lot of the other documentaries we, we, we really aren't trying to dissect the breakdown of charles and diana's marriage we're not trying to work out who was to blame um that, that isn't if i'm totally honest it's not of interest to me um mm. what i'm interested in is is trying to explore what this says about us you know what does it say about us that we 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 did turn this story into a form of of entertainment um and and and, and continue to do so you know what does it say about us that we we drive demand for paparazzi pictures and and a sort of invasion of people in public life's privacy that i think is 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 not an altogether healthy um uh sort of relationship um and and that's the part of the story that i I hope our film gets people talking about. Yeah, that's well said. Ed, thank you for this time. I have two quick questions for you. Um, one of which is one of the more beautiful scenes in this documentary is towards the end. Martin's music kind of makes its way through, but there's the close-ups of um, William and Harry. And I'm thinking like what it must be like for these two kids to watch their mother. And, and, and when they go over to the crowd and, and to say, you know, it's just, it's so powerful, Ed. And like I said, Martin's music in the background, the footage speaks for itself. I mean, this is how documentaries are supposed to be. I mean, it, it just blew me away, Ed, that, that whole, that whole, I mean, the whole thing blew me away, but the, the final five to 10 minutes specifically, geez. Well, yeah, we, look, the, it's an important moment in lots of people's lives that, that, that whole week, and especially the, the day of the funeral. I mean, people really, it takes them back 
obviously to a moment in Harry and William's life, but I think it takes them back to a moment in their own life. You know, that's what's so interesting about Diana's life. She somehow created, you know, her, her public life had these links, these kind of bridges to our own life. And so when we watch the wedding or we watch the funeral, we are, I think a lot of people are taken back into their own nostalgic past. And I think, and, and, and remember how they were feeling at the time, who they were with, what was happening in their life. Diana, I think throughout her life was a sort of vessel for lots of people's emotion and certainly in death was was that um you know i thought that footage is is heartbreaking I, i've tried to you know we've tried to handle it sensitively um and I, whenever you make documentaries whenever we take on a new story you know whether it's about a member of the royal family who's world famous or about someone that no one's ever heard of but to be brutally honest we treat it the same we treat those people the same which is to treat them with dignity and respect and to try to approach the story sensitively um as well as as truthfully and you know i'm highly aware that for me this is a film that i decided to make because i thought it was important and interesting and and, and powerful and had resonance for lots of people around the world it's a very personal story still for them and they have strong feelings for for William and Harry, it's it's not just a story, it's their life. Diana was their mother, and I'm I'm highly sensitive to that fact. I'm a similar age to them. I can't even imagine what it would be like to lose a parent, and I certainly can't imagine what it'd be like to do so under under the sort of you know the the, the gaze of the world. And and yeah, I I I find it difficult to I do find it really difficult to watch that footage and watch them walk behind um their mum's coffin through the streets of London it uh yeah it's it's immensely powerful um and I can't even really imagine what strength would have been required to do that um so yeah we tried to try to handle that moment with respect um and uh yeah hopefully people feel like we've 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 done that yeah the whole the whole film's done respectfully and, and you know there's a there's a close-up ed um of of William there's definitely sadness, but there's almost an anger there too, and rightfully so. I mean, rightfully so. I mean, you know, everything that's going on, it's it's, it's basically a circus at times. Uh -huh. But the close-ups kind of speak for themselves. Ed, I don't know if there's anger, or I mean, I can't, I don't, I don't wish to to, to guess what he was feeling. But if there if there was anger, you know, my feeling would be that it, it it's something we all need to 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 reconcile in ourselves. You know, we 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 were all part of that. We were. I say we, the public, not everyone was out there. Lots of people were highly critical of the way that, that people reacted the week after she died. And you see that criticism in the film. But um, but lots of people were out there and wanting to see Harry and William and wanting to shake their hands. And and yeah, I think there is something strange that that happens in that week and um, and happened through large parts of her life where we 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 sort of desperately wanted this story to work. You know, we we sort of, or many of us, many people you know, bought into the fairy tale myth, right? Like the fairy tale myth is a is a story that we've been telling ourselves as human beings for hundreds, but perhaps thousands of years. We've been telling ourselves variations of that story. And this archetypal story somehow came into being in the real world. And the prince fell in love with a beautiful princess and, and it happened in front of us. And it's no wonder I think that so many people fell in love with the idea of that story and willed it into being and wanted it to work and became so emotionally invested in that story um but 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 you know that 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 sort of intrusion that 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 interest that speculation um you know as i said does does have a a cost there is you know um there's a pr price to pay and uh um i hope our film um you know allows people to to ponder our role and our complicity in 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 Diana's story and in ongoing stories like that. And it's currently available on, available on HBO Max. What was it like at watching this? At a, I'm sure I'm sure it had a premiere. Watching it with other people, do you? How, how's that feel as a filmmaker to watch people watch your work, being there, watch observing what people are are, are feeling? How, how's that? That has to be kind of surreal, I would imagine. Ed. Yeah, I'm this, this two, it's a great question. There's two things I would say. One is that. Specifically, given that the story is about Diana, I, it was amazing to have people in a room together watching it because, you know, I felt like our experience of Diana was a sort of collective experience, you know, and 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 yes, everyone else had everyone had their own individual relationships with her, or felt that they did, but she was also someone that collectively we talked about, you know, on mass for most of her adult life and to get people back in a room together and talking about her 
uh, or what she came to symbolize together was really interesting. Um, the other thing that was kind of powerful was that we made this film throughout COVID. You know, we started this project just at the point when we all, at least in the UK, we went into a very heavy lockdown and we were, you know, quite literally kind of locked in our houses. And we made this film um, pretty much entirely from our bedrooms, you know, um, which which is a kind of extraordinary thing that I, I didn't, I think if, before COVID happens, like if someone had said, Look, you, can you go and make a film about Diana with a you know pretty big budget and people all around the world and you're never going to meet and stuff in person, I would have said it's just impossible. But but we somehow did manage to cobble this film together. And, and the first time the whole production team were in a room together physically was um, at a screening in London after the film was finished. You know, we never all were in a room together. Um, and we had editors sort of working scattered across Europe actually and we would sort of do this do it on zoom really um lots of FaceTime calls and zoom calls and we'd somehow piece this thing together um so yeah to be back in a room and to, to see people react um yeah it was a very powerful thing um I think I've been surprised also at how emotional people have been after screenings hmm. um a lot of people have come up to me after after this film in particular and said I wasn't expecting to feel so emotional, you know, like mm. it was a story that happened 25 years ago. I felt like I'd sort of left it there. I was sad at the time, but I knew, you know, I know what's going to happen. So I didn't think it would, it would get me. Um, and, and I've had some interesting conversations about that with people. And I think it is about, it is about this, the way in which Diana's story somehow seemed to connect with our own lives. And I think often when I ask, you know, when I have the conversation with people about why they felt so emotional, it's often because the story and the archive somehow took them back into their own life, you know, and took them back to really powerful, poignant moments in their own life. And, and, and that, that is a, that's a I think that's a powerful thing. A film and documentary can, can access and can take audiences back to, to nostalgic moments in their own past. Um, yeah, that's a, it's a, it's a, it's a powerful emotional well. Um, and, Diana's story definitely seems to do that for a lot of people. Um, so yeah, I, I, I still, you know, I, I had, a, I went through a, a personal trauma of my own while making it, a family trauma, and I, I struggle definitely watching, watching the film now, especially that final twenty minutes. You know, it, it takes on a very different resonance for me personally. Um, you know, something I totally unrelated to Diana, but it's something I went through at the same time as making this film, and perhaps lots of other people feel. They have similar links and bridges between their own personal life and, and Diana's story. So um, yeah, it's been it's been a really interesting and an interesting one to see people's reaction. Yeah, and it's amazing hearing you say that Ed, you know the trauma you went through the 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 pandemic. You know, listen, having to piece things together, never really being in person for you know, and, and to see the final product as excellent as it is 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 a story in itself. I feel like Ed. Well, I, I hope so. I mean, they're they're always challenging these films, aren't they? But um, but I, I hope we've done something that people people are are able to to engage with emotionally and 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 um and respond to and and yeah, I really look forward to hearing people's thoughts on the film. Actually, you sort of especially when you make it in your bedroom, it, it, you never sort of quite imagine that it's going to go out into the world and actually be seen by people. And especially with a film, a story, you know, the, the stories I've done up to now, "Tell Me Who I Am" and "Black Sheep" and "Gun It's Gold," they were. They were stories that come somehow kind of captured captured me, captivated me, but they were stories that hadn't really been told widely, if at all. This is a sort of totally different proposition because this is a this is a film that was well, a story that everyone has their own preconceived ideas and strong opinions on, you know. And I think one of the one of the one of the things we realized quite early on with this film was that everyone will bring their own emotional baggage to this film because we have all just by osmosis kind of consumed the analysis and reanalysis of, of the Diana story in the last two decades, two and a half decades. And, and to try to pretend that people would come at this fresh was, was, it was never going to work. So that the aim here really is to try to make a film that acts as a time machine that tells the story and allows the story to play out in, in the present tense. And that sort of casts a spell over you that doesn't let you escape from from you know the contemporaneous archive but that also allows viewers to bring their own hindsight to bear you know i want people to bring their own feelings and opinions and their own analysis to bear on this story and and hopefully by doing that they will um 
yeah, they'll be able to not just relive the story, but also see it afresh. Yeah, it's it's special for sure. Uh, Ed, I've been dying to ask you this uh, final question: what What is next for you? Because I feel like w whenever I, I I'm always curious about your next topic, your next movie. Have you Have you established that? Are you working on that? Whatever you can say, Ed. Whatever you're comfortable. Yeah, we're working on it. We haven't yet found. You know, as I said at the beginning, you know, these things they take over your life for a couple of years. Yeah, you need to use stories that that you find totally engrossing that you can't imagine not telling you know I, i've actually wanted to make this film for five or six years and wow i think for the first three or four of that i i guess we got busy making other films but i think also when i talked to simon chin who i work with who produced this um you know he wasn't i think he was he wasn't sure when i first came to him saying i'd love to make a film about diana he wasn't sure that we necessarily had found a new perspective on this story and i think it sometimes it takes a few years of just sitting with a story and trying to work out what you have to say that's new um, before you, you kind of find the confidence to, to go forward and tell it. So I don't know specifically what's next. We're definitely looking at lots and lots of stories and and I'm sure one will will grab our attention and, and feel like we, um, yeah, we, we have no choice but to tell it. Yeah, and I have to say my last thing, you are absolutely one of my favorite filmmakers and thank you for all your awesome work. I, I enjoy it, I rewatch it. I'm just, I'm a huge fan and I, I just admire everything you bring to the screen. Oh, that's really kind. It's, it's a real privilege to chat today. And thanks for, for all your kind words. And um, I really look forward to hearing your your listeners' uh, thoughts on the film. Um, yeah, it's, 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 it's exciting to share it with people. Ed, thank you for all this time. Take care of yourself. And um, nothing but health and happiness for you, my friend. Pleasure. And to you. Thanks so much.